Hello everybody. Uh, today we'll be reading um, the first chapter of Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. Uh, this is the first time that I've read it as well, or that I'll be reading it. So if I make any mistakes or have any difficulties with the pronunciation, um, please forgive me. It's not my intention. So I just got these. This is going to be book one. Not sure if you can see that there. But this is a first edition of the Harvard Classics from 1909. So, without further ado, being very careful with the pages, uh, let's begin. So, this is the introductory note at the start of the book. Benjamin Franklin was born in Milk Street, Boston on January the 6th, 1706. His father, Josiah Franklin, was a tallow chandler who married twice, and of his 17 children, Benjamin was the youngest son. His schooling ended at 10, and at 12 he was bound apprentice to his brother James, a printer who published the New England Corrent. To this journal he became a contributor, and later was for a time its nominal editor. But the brothers quarreled, and Benjamin ran away, going first to New York and thence to Philadelphia, where he arrived in October 1723. He soon obtained work as a printer, but after a few months he was induced by Governor Keith to go to London, where, finding Keith's promises empty, he again worked as a compositor till he was brought back to Philadelphia by a merchant named Denman, who gave him a position in his business. On Denman's death, he returned to his former trade and shortly set up a printing house of his own from which he published the Pennsylvania Gazette, to which he contributed many essays and which he made a medium for agitating a variety of local reforms. In 1732, he began to issue his famous Poor Richard's Almanac, for the enrichment of which he borrowed or composed those pithy utterances utterances of worldly wisdom, which are the basis of a large part of his popular reputation. In 1758, the year in which he ceased writing for the Almanac, he printed in it Father Abraham's Sermon, now regarded as the most famous piece of literature produced in colonial America. Meantime, Franklin was concerning himself more and more with public affairs. He set forth a scheme for an academy, which was taken up later and finally developed into the University of Pennsylvania, and he founded an American ph Philosophical Society for the purpose of enabling scientific men to communicate their discoveries to one another. He himself had already begun his electrical researches, which, with other scientific inquiries, he carried on in the intervals of money-making and politics to the end of his life. In 1748, he sold his business in order to get leisure for study, having now acquired comparative wealth, and in a few years he had made discoveries that gave him a reputation with the learned throughout Europe. In politics, he proved very able, both as an administrator and as a controversialist, but his record as an office holder is stained by the use he made of his position to advance his relatives. His most notable service in home politics was his reform of the postal system, but his fame as a statesman rests chiefly on his services in connection with the relations of the colonies with Great Britain and later with France. In 1757, he was sent to England to protest against the influence of the Pens in the government of the colony, and for five years he remained there, striving to enlighten the people and the Ministry of England as to colonial conditions. On his return to America, he played an honorable part in the Paxton Affair, through which he lost his seat in the embassy, sorry, in the assembly. But in 1764, he was again dispatched to England as agent for the colony, this time to petition the king to resume the government from the hands of the proprietors. In London, he actively opposed the proposed Stamp Act, but lost the credit for this, and much of his popularity through his securing for a friend the office of stamp agent in America. 
Even his effective work in helping to obtain the repeal of the act left him still a suspect, but he continued his efforts to present the case for the colonies as the troubles thickened toward the crisis of the revolution. In 1767, he crossed to France, where he was received with honor, but before his return home in 1775, he lost his position as postmaster through his share in divulging to Massachusetts the famous letter of Hutchinson and Oliver. On his arrival in Philadelphia, he was chosen a member of the Continental Congress, and in 1777, he was dispatched to France as Commissioner for the United States. Here he remained till 1785, the favorite of French society, and with such success did he conduct the affairs of his country that when he finally returned, he received a place only second to that of Washington as the champion of American independence. He died on April 17, 1790. The first five chapters of the autobiography were composed in England in 1771, continued in 1784 to 85, and again in 1788, at which date he brought it down to 1757. After a most extraordinary series of adventures, the original form of the manuscript was finally printed by Mr. John Bigelow, and is here reproduced in recognition of its value as a picture of one of the most notable personalities of colonial times, and of his end of its acknowledged rank as one of the great autobiographies of the world. So here it says, um, Benjamin Franklin, his autobiography from 1706 to 1757. I guess this is uh, part one, as it were. Twyford at the Bishop of St. Asaph's, 1771. Dear son, I have ever had pleasure in obtaining any little anecdotes of my ancestors. You may remember the inquiries I made among the remains of my relations when you were with me in England, and the journey I undertook for that purpose. Imagining it may be equally agreeable to you to know the circumstances of my life, many of which you are not yet, many of which you are yet acqu unacquainted with and expecting the enjoyment of a week's uninterrupted leisure in my present country retirement, I sit down to write them for you, to which I have besides some other inducements. Having emerged from the poverty and obscurity in which I was born and bred to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity, the conducing means I made use of, which with the blessing of God so well succeeded, my posterity may like to know, as they may find some of them suitable to their own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. That felicity, when I reflected upon it, has induced me sometimes to say that were it offered to my choice, I should have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in a second edition to correct some faults of the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accidents and events of it for others more favorable. But though this were denied, I should still accept the offer. Since such a repetition is not to be expected, the next thing most like living one's life over again seems to be a recollection of that life and to make that recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. Hereby, too, I shall, indulge, I shall indulge the inclination so natural in old men to be talking of themselves and their own past actions, and I shall indulge it without being tiresome to others, who, through respect to age, might conceive themselves obliged to give me a hearing, since this may be read or not, as any one pleases. And lastly, I may as well confess it, since the denial of it will be believed by nobody. Perhaps I shall a good deal gratify my own vanity. Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words, without vanity I may say, etc. But some vain thing immediately followed. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever share they have of it themselves, but I give it fair quarter wherever I meet with it, 
being persuaded that it is often productive of good to the possessor, and to others that are within his sphere of action, and therefore, in many cases, it would not be altogether absurd if a man were to thank God for his vanity among the other comforts of life. And now I speak of thanking God. I desire with all humility to acknowledge that I owe the mentioned happiness of my past life to his kind providence, which led me to the means I used and gave them success. My belief of this induces me to hope, though I must not presume that the same goodness will still be exercised toward me in continuing that happiness, or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse, which I may experience as others have done. The complexion of my future fortune being known to him, only in whose power it is to bless to us even our afflictions. The notes one of my uncles, who had the same kind of curiosity in collecting family anecdotes, once put into my hands, furnished me with several particulars relating to our ancestors. From these notes, I learned that the family had lived in the same village, Ecton, in Northamptonshire, for three hundred years, and how much longer he knew not, perhaps from the time when the name of Franklin, that before was the name of an order of people, was assumed by them as a surname when others took surnames all over the kingdom. On a freehold of about thirty acres, aided by the smith's business, which had continued in the family till his time, the eldest son being always bred to that business, a custom which he and my father followed, as to their eldest sons. When I searched the registers at Ecton, I found an account of their births, marriages, and burials from the year 1555 only, there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding. By that register I perceived that I was the youngest son of the youngest son for five generations back. My grandfather Thomas, who was born in 1598, lived at Ecton till he grew too old to follow business longer, when he went to live with his son John, a dyer at Banbury in Oxfordshire, with whom my father served an apprenticeship. There my grandfather died and lies buried. We saw his gravestone in 1758. His eldest son Thomas lived in the house at Ecton and left it with the land to his only child, a daughter, who, with her husband, one fisher of, well of Wellingborough, sold it to Mr. Eisted, now lord of the manor there. My grandfather had four sons that grew up, um, for example, Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. I will give you what account I can of them, at this distance from my papers, and if these are not lost in my absence, you will among them find many more particulars. Thomas was bred a smith under his father, but being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman in that parish, he qualified himself for the business of Scrivener, became a considerable man in the county, was a chief mover of all public spirited undertakings for the county or town of Northampton and his own village, of which many instances were related of him, and much taken notice of and patronized by the then Lord Halifax. He died in 1702, January the 6th, old style, just four years to a day before I was born. The account we received of his life and character from some old people at Acton, I remember, struck you as something extraordinary from its similarity to what you knew of mine. Had he died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed the transmigration. John was bred a dyer, I believe of woolens. Benjamin was bred a silk dyer, serving an apprenticeship at London. He was an ingenious man. I remember him well, for when I was a boy he came over to my father in Boston and lived in the house with us some years. He lived to a great age. His grandson, Samuel Franklin, now lives in Boston. He left behind him two quarter volumes, MS, of his own poetry, consisting of little occasional pieces addressed to his friends and relations, of which the following, sent to me, is a specimen. 
here follow in the margin the words in brackets, here insert it, but the poetry is not given. Mr. Sparks informs us, from the life of Franklin, page 6, that these volumes had been preserved and were in possession of Mrs. Emmons of Boston, great-granddaughter of their author. He had formed a shorthand of his own, which he taught me, but never practicing it, I have now forgot it. I was named after this uncle, there being a particular affection between him and my father. He was very pious, a great attender of sermons of the best preachers, which he had took down in his shorthand, and had with him many volumes of them. He was also much of a, po of a politician, too much, perhaps, for his station. There fell lately into my hands, in London, a collection he had made of all the principal pamphlets relating to public affairs from 1641 to 1717. Many of the volumes are wanting, as appears by the numbering, but there still remain eight volumes in folio, and twenty-four in quarto, and in octavo. A dealer in old books met with them, and knowing me by my sometimes buying of him, he brought them to me. It seems my uncle must have left him them here when he went to America, which was about fifty years since. There are many of his notes in the margins. This obscure family of ours was early in the Reformation and continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of their zeal against popery or popery. They had got an English Bible and to conceal and secure it, it was fastened open with tapes under and within the cover of a joint stool. When my great-great-grandfather read it to his family, he turned up the joint stool upon his knees, turning over the leaves, then under the tapes. One of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparator coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court. In that case, the stool was turned down again upon its feet, when the Bible remained concealed under it as before. This anecdote I had from my Uncle Benjamin. The family continued all of the Church of England till about the end of Charles II's reign, when some of the ministers that had been outed for nonconformity holding conventicles in Northamptonshire, Benjamin and Josiah adhered to them, and so continued all their lives. The rest of the family remained with the Episcopal Church. Josiah, my father, married young, and carried his wife with three children into New England about 1682. The conventicles, having been forbidden by law and frequently disturbed, induced some considerable men of his acquaintance to remove to that country, and he was prevailed with to accompany them thither, where they expected to enjoy their mode of religion with freedom. By the same wife he had four more children, more born there, and by a second wife, ten more, in all seventeen, of which I remember thirteen sitting at one time at his table, who all grew up to be men and women, and married. I was the youngest son, and the youngest child but two, and was born in Boston, New England. My mother, the second wife, was Abia Folger, daughter of Peter Folger, one of the first settlers of New England, of whom honorable mention is made by Cotton Mather, Cotton Mather in his church history of that country entitled Magnolia Christi Americana as a godly, learned Englishman, if I remember the words rightly. I have heard that he wrote sundry small occasional pieces, but only one of them was printed, which I saw now many years since. It was written in 1675, in the homespun verse of that time and people, and addressed to those then concerned in the government there. It was in favor of liberty of conscience, and in behalf of the Baptists, Quakers, and other sectaries that had been under persecution, ascribing the Indian Wars and other distresses that had befallen the country to that persecution, as so many judgments of God to punish so heinous an offense, and exhorting a repeal of those uncharitable laws. The whole appeared to me as written with a good deal of decent plainness and manly freedom. The six concluding lines I remember, though I have forgotten the two first of the stanza, but the purport of them was, 
that his censures proceeded from goodwill, and therefore he would be known to be the author. In quotations, because to be a libeler, says he, I hate it with my heart. From Sherburn town where I now, where now I dwell, my name I do put here. Without offense, your real friend, it is Peter Folgier. End quotations. My elder brothers were all put apprentices to different trades. I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age, my father intending to devote me as the tithe of his or the tithy of his sons to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early, as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar encouraged him in his purpose of this. My uncle Benjamin, too, approved of it and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons, I suppose as a stock to set up with if I would learn his character. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and farther was removed into the next class above it, in order to go with that into the third at the end of the year. But my father, in the meantime, from a view of the expense of a college education, which having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living so many ed uh, and the mean living many so educated were afterwards able to obtain, reasons that he gave to his friends in my hearing, altered his first intention, took me from the grammar school, and sent me to a school for writing and arithmetic, kept by a then famous man, Mr. George Brownell, very successful in his profession generally, and that by mild encouraging me and by that, and that by mild encouraging methods. Under him I acquired fair writing pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic and made no progress in it. At ten years old, I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of a tallow chandler and soap boiler, a business he was not bred to, but had assumed on his arrival in New England, and on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being in little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for the candles, filling the dipping mold and the molds for cast candles, attending the shop, going of errands, etc. I disliked the trade, and had a strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it. However, living near the water, I was much in and about it, learnt early to swim well, and to manage boats, and when in a boat or canoe with other boys, I was commonly allowed to govern, especially in the case of difficulty, and upon other occasions, I was generally a leader among the boys, and sometimes led them into scrapes, of which I will mention one instance, as it shows an early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. There was a salt marsh that bounded part of the mill pond, on the edge of which, at high water, we used to stand to fish for minnows. By much trampling, we had made it a mere quagmire. My proposal was to build a wharf there, fit for us to stand upon, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the marsh, and which would very well suit our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening, when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working with them diligently like so many emmets, sometimes two or three to a stone, we brought them all away and built our little wharf. The next morning the workmen were surprised at missing the stones, which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made after the removers. We were discovered and complained of. Several of us were corrected by our fathers, and though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. I think you may like to know something of his person and character. He had an excellent constitution of body was of middle stature, but well set and very strong. He was ingenious, could draw prettily, and skilled a little in music, and had a clear, pleasing voice, so that when he played psalm tunes on his violin and sung withal, as he sometimes did in an evening after the business of the day was over, it was extremely agreeable to hear. He had a mechanical genius, too, 
and on occasion was very handy in the use of other tradesmen's tools. But his great excellence lay in a sound understanding and solid judgment in prudential matters, both in private and public affairs. In the latter, indeed, he was never employed. The numerous family he had to educate, and the straightness of his circumstances keeping him close to his trade. But I remember well his being frequently visited by leading people who consulted him for his opinion in affairs of the town or of the church he belonged to, and showed a good deal of respect for his judgment and advice. He was also much consulted by private persons about their affairs when any difficulty occurred and frequently chosen an arbitrator between contending parties. At his table he liked to have, as often as he could, some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with, and always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic for discourse, which might tend to improve the minds of his children. By this means he turned our attention to what was good, just, and prudent in the conduct of life and little or no notice was taken of what related to the victuals on the table, whether it was well or ill-dressed, in or out of season, of good or bad flavor, preferable or inferior to this or that other thing of the kind, so that I was brought up in such a perfect inattention to those matters as to be quite indifferent what kind of food was set before me, and so unobservant of it that to this day, if I am asked, I can scarce tell a few hours after dinner what I dined upon. This has been a convenience to me in traveling, where my companions have been sometimes very unhappy for want of a suitable gratification of their more delicate, because better instructed, tastes and appetites. My mother had likewise an excellent constitution. She suckled all of her ten children. She suckled all her ten children. I never knew either my father or mother to have any sickness but that of which they died, he at eighty-nine and she at eighty-five years of age. They lay, they lie buried together at Boston, where I some years since placed a marble over their grave with this inscription. Josiah Franklin and Abiah his wife, Abia his wife, lie here interred. They lived lovingly together in wedlock fifty-five years, without an estate or any gainful employment, by constant labor and industry, with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably, and brought up thirteen children and seven grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged to diligence in thy calling, and distrust not providence. He was a pious and prudent man she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in filial, in, filial regard, in filial regard to their memory, places this stone. J.F. born 1655, died 1744. A.F. born 1667, died 1752. By my rambling digressions, I perceived myself to be grown old. I used to write more methodically, but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. Tis perhaps only negligence. To return, I continued thus employed in my father's business for two years, that is, till I was twelve years old, and my brother John, who was bred to that business, having left my father, married, and set up for himself at Rhode Island, there was all appearance that I was destined to supply his place and become a tallow chandler. But my dislike to the trade continuing, my father was under apprehensions that if he did not find one for me more agreeable, I should break away and get to sea, as his son Josiah had done, to his great vexation. He therefore sometimes took me to walk with him and see joiners, bricklayers, turners, braziers, etc. at their work that he might observe my inclination, and endeavor to fix it on some trade or other on, on land. It has ever been since a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools, and it has been useful to me, having learnt so much by it as to be able to do little jobs myself in my house when a workman could not readily be got, and to construct little machines 
for my experiments while the intention of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind. My father at last fixed upon the cutter's trade, the cutler's trade, and my uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was bred to that business in London, being about that time established in Boston, I was to be sent with him some time on liking. But his expectations of a fee with me displeasing my father, I was taken home again. From a child I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came into my hands was ever laid out in books. Pleased with the Pil Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was of John Bunyan's works in separate little volumes. I afterwards sold them to enable me to buy R. Burton's historical collections. They were small Chapman's books, and cheap, forty or fifty in all. My father's little library consisted chiefly of books in polemic divinity, most of which I read, and have since often regretted that. At a time when I had such a thirst for knowledge, more proper books had not fallen in my way, since it was now resolved I should not be a clergyman. Plutarch's Lives there was in which I read abundantly, and I still think that time spent to great advantage. There was also a book of Defoe's called An Essay on Projects, and another of Dr. Mather's called Essays to Do Good which perhaps gave me a turn of thinking that had an influence on some of the principal future events of my life. This bookish inclination at length determined my father to make me a printer, though he had already one son, James, of that profession. In 1717, my brother James returned from England with a press and letters to set up his business in Boston. I liked it much better than that of my father, but still had a hankering for the sea. To prevent the apprehended effect of such an inclination, my father was impatient to have me bound to my brother. I stood out some time, but at last was persuaded, and signed the indentures when I was yet but twelve years old. I was to serve as an apprentice till I was twenty-one years of age. Only I was allowed to be... Only I was to be allowed journeyman's wages during the last year. In a little time I made great proficiency in the business, and became a useful hand to my brother. I now had access to better books. An acquaintance with the apprentices of booksellers enabled me sometimes to borrow a small one, which I was careful to return soon and clean. Often I sat up in my room, reading the greatest part of the night, when the book was borrowed in the evening and to be returned early in the morning, lest it should be missed or wanted and after some time an ingenious tradesman, Mr. Matthew Adams, who had a pretty collection of books and who frequented our printing house, took notice of me, invited me to his library, and very kindly lent me such books as I chose to read. I now took a fancy to poetry and made some little pieces. My brother, thinking it might turn to account, encouraged me and put me on composing occasional ballads. One was called The Lighthouse Tragedy, and contained an account of the drowning of Captain Worthy Lake with his two daughters. The other was a sailor's song on the taking of Teach or Blackbeard the Pirate. They were wretched stuff, in the Grub Street ballad style, and when they were printed he sent me about the town to sell them. The first sold wonderfully, the event being recent, having made a great noise. This flattered my vanity, but my father discouraged me by ridiculing my performances and telling me verse-makers were generally beggars. So I escaped being a poet, most probably a very bad one, but as prose writing had been of great use to me in the course of my life, and was a principal means of my advancement, I shall tell you how, in such a situation, I acquired what little ability I have in that way. There was another bookish lad in the town. John Collins by name, with whom I was intimately acquainted. We sometimes disputed, and very fond we were of argument, and very desirous of confuting one another, which dis, dis, disputatious turn, which disputatious turn, by the way, is apt to become a very bad habit, making people often extremely disagreeable in company by the contradiction that is necessary to bring it into practice. And thence, 
being souring and spoiling the conversation is productive of disgusts and perhaps enmities where you may have occasion for friendship. I had caught it by reading my father's book of dispute about religion. Persons of good sense, I have since observed, seldom fall into it, except lawyers, university men, and men of all sorts that have been bred at Edinburgh. A question was once, somehow or other, started between Collins and me, of the propriety of educating the female sex in learning and their abilities for study. He was of opinion that it was improper, and that they were naturally unequal to it. I took the contrary side, perhaps a little for dispute's sake. He was naturally more eloquent, had a ready plenty of words, and sometimes, as I thought, bore me down more by his fluency than by the strength of his reasons. As we parted without settling the point, and were not to see one another again for some time, I sat down to put my arguments in writing, which I copied fair and sent to him. He answered, and I replied. Three or four letters of a side had passed, when my father happened to find my papers and read, and read them. Without entering into the discussion, he took occasion to talk to me about the manner of my writing, observed that, though I had the advantage of my antagonist in correct spelling and pointing, which I owed to the printing house, I fell far short in elegance of expression, in method, and in perspicuity, of which he convinced me by several instances. I saw the justice of his remark, and thence grew more attentive to the manner in writing, and determined to endeavor at improvement. About this time I met with an odd volume of The Spectator. It was the third. I had never before seen any of them. I bought it, read it over and over, and was much delighted with it. I thought the writing excellent, and wished, if possible, to imitate it. With this view I took some of the papers, and making short hints of the sentiment in each sentence, laid them by a few days, and then, without looking at the book, tried to complete the papers again by expressing each hinted sentiment at length, and as fully as it had been expressed before, in any suitable words that should come to hand. Then I compared my spectator with the original discovered some of my faults, and corrected them. But I found I wanted a stock of words, or a readiness in recollecting and using them, which I thought I should have acquired before that time if I had gone on making verses. Since the continual occasion for words of the same import, but of different length, to suit the measure, or of different sound for the rhyme, would have laid me under a constant necessity of searching for variety, and also have tended to fix that variety in my mind, and make me master of it. Therefore, I took some of the tales, and turned them into verse, and after a time, when I had pretty well forgotten the prose, turned them back again. I also sometimes jumbled my collections of hints into confusion, and after some weeks, endeavored to reduce them into the best order, before I began to form the full sentences and complete the paper. This was to teach me method in the arrangement of thoughts. By comparing my work afterwards with the original, I discovered many faults and amended them, but I sometimes had the pleasure of fancying that, in certain particulars of small import, I had been lucky enough to improve the method or language, and this encouraged me to think I might possibly in time come to be a tolerable English writer, of which I was extremely ambitious. My time for these exercises, and for reading, was at night, after work, or before it began in the morning, or on Sundays, when I contrived to be in the printing house alone, evading as much as I could the common attendance on public worship which my father used to exact on me when I was under his care, and which indeed I still thought a duty, though I could not, as it seemed to me, afford time to practice it. When about sixteen years of age, I happened to meet with a book, written by one Tryon, recommending a vegetable diet, I determined to go into it. My brother, being yet unmarried, did not keep house, but boarded himself and his apprentices in another family. My refusing to eat flesh occasioned an inconveniency, and I was frequently chid for my singularity, 
I made myself acquainted with Tryon's manner of preparing some of his dishes, such as boiling potatoes or rice, making hasty pudding, and a few others, and then proposed to my brother that if he would give me weekly half the money he paid for my board, I would board myself. He instantly agreed to it, and I pr presently found that I could save half what he paid me. This was an additional fund for buying books, but I had another advantage in it. My brother and the rest going from the printing house to their meals, I remained there alone, and dispatching presently my light repast, which often was no more than a biscuit or a slice of bread, a handful of raisins or a tart from the pastry cooks, and a glass of water, had the rest of the time till their return for study, in which I made the greater progress from that greater clearness of head and quicker apprehension which usually attend temperance in eating and drinking. And now it was that, being on some occasion made ashamed of my ignorance and figures, which I had twice failed in learning when at school, I took Cocker's book of arithmetic and went through the whole book by myself with great ease. I also read Sellers and Shermie's books of navigation and became acquainted with the little geometry they contain but never proceeded far in that science. And I read about this time Locke on Human Understanding and the Art of Thinking by Messieurs du Port Royal. While I was intent on improving my language, I met with an English grammar. I think it was Greenwood's, at the end of which there were two little sketches of the arts of rhetoric and logic, the latter finishing with a specimen of a dispute in the Socratic method and soon after I procured Xenophon's memorable Things of Socrates, wherein there are many instances of the same method. I was charmed with it, adopted it, dropped my abrupt contradiction and positive argumentation, and put on the humble inquirer and doubter, and being then, from reading Shaftesbury and Collins, become a real doubter in many points of our religious doctrine, I found this method safest for myself and very embarrassing to those against whom I used it. Therefore I took a delight in it, practiced it continually, and grew very artful and expert in drawing people, even of superior knowledge, into concessions, the consequences of which they did not foresee entangling them in difficulties out of which they could not extricate themselves, and so obtaining victories that neither myself nor my cause always deserved. I continued this method some few years, but gradually left it, retaining only the habit of expressing myself in terms of modest diffidence, never using, when I advanced anything that may possibly be disputed, the words certainly, undoubtedly, or any others that give the air of positiveness to an opinion, but rather say, I conceive or apprehend a thing to be so and so. It appears to me, or I should think it so or so, for such and such reasons, or I imagine it to be so, or it is so if I am not mistaken. This habit, I believe, has been of great advantage to me when I have had occasion to inculcate my opinions and persuade men into measures that I have been from time to time engaged in promoting, and as the chief ends of conversation are to inform or to be informed, to please or to persuade, I wish well-meaning, sensible men would not lessen their power of doing good by a positive assuming manner that seldom fails to disgust, tends to create opposition and to defeat and to defeat every one of those purposes for which speech was given to us, to wit, giving or receiving information or pleasure. For, if you would inform, a positive and dogmatical manner in advancing your sentiments may provoke contradiction and prevent a candid attention. If you wish information and improvement from the knowledge of others, and yet at the same time express yourself as firmly fixed in your present opinions, modest, sensible men who do not love disputation will probably leave you undisturbed in the possession of your error. And by such a manner, you can seldom hope to recommend yourself in pleasing your hearers or to persuade those whose concurrence you desire. Pope says judici judiciously, 
in quotations, men should be taught as if you taught them not, and things unknown proposed as things forgot, in quotations. Farther recommending to us, further recommending to us, in quotations, to speak thou sure with seeming diffidence, in quotations. And he might have coupled with this line, that which he has coupled with another, I think, less properly, in quotations, for want of modesty is want of sense, in quotations. If you ask why less properly, I must repeat the lines, in quotations, and modest words admit of no defense, for want of modesty is want of sense, and quotation marks. Now is not want of sense, where a man is so unfortunate as to want it, some apology for his want of modesty, and would not the line stand more justly thus? In quotations, modest words admit but this defense, that want of modesty is want of sense, and quotation marks. This, however, I should submit to better judgments. My brother had, in 1720 or 1721, begun to print a newspaper. It was the second that appeared in America, and was called the New England Current. The only one before it was the Boston Newsletter. I remember his being dissuaded by some of his friends from the undertaking as not likely to succeed, one newspaper being, in their judgment, enough for America. At this time, 1771, there are not less than five and twenty. He went on, however, with the undertaking, and after having worked in composing the types and printing off the sheets, I was employed to carry the papers through the streets to the customers. He had some ingenious men among his friends, who amused themselves by writing little pieces for this paper, which gained it credit and made it more in demand, and these gentlemen often visited us. Hearing their conversations and their accounts of the approbation their papers were received with, I was excited to try my hand among them. But being still a boy, and suspecting that my brother would object to printing anything of mine in his paper if, I, if he knew it to be mine, I contrived to disguise my hand, and writing an anonymous paper, I put it in at night under the door of the printing house. It was found in the morning and communicated to his writing friends when they called in as usual. They read it, commented on it in my hearing, and I had the exquisite pleasure of finding it met with their approbation, and that, in their different guesses at the author, none were named but men of some character among us for learning and ingenuity. I suppose now that I was rather lucky in my judges, and that perhaps they were not really so very good ones as I then esteemed them. Encouraged, however, by this, I wrote and conveyed in the same way to the press several more papers which were equally approved, and I kept my secret till my small fund of sense for such performances was pretty well exhausted, and then I discovered it when I began to be considered a little more by my brother's acquaintance, and in a manner that did not quite please him, as he thought, probably with reason, that it tended to make me too vain. And perhaps this might be one occasion of the differences that we began to have about this time. Though a brother, he considered himself as my master, and me as his apprentice, and accordingly expected the same services from me as he would from another, while I thought he demeaned me too much in some he required of me, who from a brother expected more indulgence. Our disputes were often brought before our father, and I fancy I was either generally in the right, or else a better pleader, because the judgment was generally in my favor. But my brother was passionate, and had often beaten me, which I took extremely amiss, and thinking my apprenticeship very tedious, I was continually wishing for some opportunity of shortening it, at which length offered in a manner unexpected. And there's a footnote here. I fancy his harsh and tyrannical treatment of me might be a means of impressing me with that aversion to arbitrary power that has stuck to me through my whole life. One of the pieces in our newspaper on some political point, which I have now forgotten, gave offense to the assembly. He was taken up, censored, and imprisoned for a month by the speaker's warrant, I suppose, because he would not discover his author. 
I too was taken up and examined before the council, but though I did not give them any satisfaction, they, could, they contented themselves with admonishing me, and dismissed me, considering me, perhaps, as an apprentice who was bound to keep his master's secrets. During my brother's confinement, which I resented a good deal, notwithstanding our private differences, I had the management of the paper, and I made bold to give our, our rulers some rubs in it, which my brother took very kindly, while others began to consider me in an unfavorable light, as a young genius that had a turn for libeling and satire. My brother's discharge was accompanied with an order of the house, a very odd one, that James Franklin should no longer print the paper called the New England Current. There was a consultation held in our printing house among his friends, what he should do in this case. Some proposed to evade the order by changing the name of the paper, but my brother, seeing inconveniences in that, it was finally concluded on as a better way to let it be printed for the future under the name of Benjamin Franklin and to avoid the censure of the assembly that might fall on him as still printing it by his apprentice, the contrivance was that my old indenture should be returned to me, with a full discharge on the back of it, to be shown on occasion, but to secure to him the benefit of my service. I was to sign new indentures for the remainder of the term, which were to be kept private. A very flimsy scheme it was, however it was immediately executed and the paper went on accordingly, under my name for several months. At length, a fresh difference arising between my brother and me, I took upon me to assert my freedom, presuming that he would not venture to produce the new indentures. It was not fair in me to take this advantage, and this I therefore reckon one of the first errata of my life. But the unfairness of it weighed little with me, when under the impressions of resentment for the blows his passion too often urged him to bestow upon me, though he was otherwise not an ill-natured man. Perhaps I was too saucy and provoking. When he found I would leave him, he took care to prevent my getting employment in any other printing house of the town by going round and speaking to every master, who accordingly refused to give me work. I then thought of going to New York, as the nearest place where there was a printer, and I was rather inclined to leave Boston when I reflected that I had already made myself a little obnoxious to the governing party, and, from the arbitrary proceedings of the assembly in my brother's case, it was likely I might, if I stayed, soon bring myself into scrapes, and further, that my indiscreet disputations about religion began to make me pointed at with horror by good people as an infidel or atheist. I determined on the point, but my father now siding with my brother, I was sensible that, if I attempted to go openly, means would be used to prevent me. My friend Collins, therefore, undertook to manage a little for me. He agreed with the captain of a New York sloop for my passage, under the notion of my being a young acquaintance of his, that had got a naughty girl with child, whose friends would compel me to marry her, and therefore I could not appear or come away publicly. So I sold some of my books to raise a little money, was taken on board privately, and as we had a fair wind, in three days I found myself in New York, near three hundred miles from home, a boy of but seventeen, without the least recommendation to or knowledge of any person in the place, and with very little money in my pocket. My inclinations for the sea were by this time worn out, or I might now have gratified them. But having a trade, and supposing myself a pretty good workman, I offered my service to the printer in the place, old Mr. William Bradford, who had been the first printer in Pennsylvania, but removed from thence upon the quarrel of George Keith. He could give me no, un no employment, having little to do, and help enough already. But says he, my son at Philadelphia has lately lost his principal hand. Aquila rose by death. If you go thither, I believe he may employ you. Philadelphia was a hundred miles further. I set out, however, in a boat for Amboy, leaving my chest and things to follow me round by sea. In crossing the bay, we met with a squall that tore our rotten sails to pieces, 
prevented our getting into the kill, and drove us upon Long Island. In our way, a drunken Dutchman, who was a passenger too, fell overboard. When he was sinking, I reached through the water to his shock pate and drew him up so that we got him in again. His ducking sobered him a little, and he went to sleep, taking first out of his pocket a book which he desired I would dry for him. It proved to be my old favorite author, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, in Dutch, finely printed on good paper, with copper cuts, a dress better than I had ever seen it wear in its own language. Well, I suppose that means I should stop for now. Join me next time and we'll continue the rest of this chapter. Have a great day.